You know why? He said to get started, right? I'm ready. He wants you to bring us in. Okay. Hallelujah. Hey, we're going to get started. Amen. Let me ask you. Welcome to Calvary Chapel, La Mesa. It's always good to see people chatting it up. You know what I'm saying? In the house of the Lord. That's what the body of Christ does. Hallelujah. Now we're going to come together and we're going to fellowship with Papa. Amen. So we're going to do that by honoring him with our lips and our hearts. Amen. If you don't mind, let's stand real quick and invite the presence of the Lord. You know what they say, I know you guys, some of you guys have been to court before. They say, all rise when the judge comes in. And God is the righteous judge. Amen. Amen. So, Lord God, even now by faith, we come before you as the united body of Christ. Lord, we are your children. We know that you are our God. We know that you love us. We know that you died. That we might know you in spirit and in truth, Father. And even now, as we worship you, Lord God. We ask you, Lord, to receive from us praise and adoration that is due your holy name. For you alone are holy, Lord God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you like to stand, stand. If you like to sit, feel free to sit. But put your hearts and minds on God. Let's worship the King of glory. Amen. Amen, guys. You know, the Lord didn't come to make bad people good. He came to make dead people alive. He wants us to see him. Scripture tells us that if we seek him, we'll find him if we seek with all our heart. He wants to be revealed among his people. You know, uh, that's what a wedding is about, by the way, is you are revealing yourself to your one that you're made one with. Lord wants us to uh, be with him. He wants to reveal himself to us. Open up. Lord, we want to see Jesus, to reach out and touch Him, and say that we love Him. Open our ears, Lord. to listen, open our eyes, Lord, we want to see Jesus, open our eyes, Lord, we want to see out and touch him and say that we love him open our ears Lord and help us to kneel before the Lord our God our maker come let us worship and bow down let us kneel before the Lord our God our maker for he Just the sheep of his hand. Come, let us worship and bow down. 
Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. Just a sheep of his hand. I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you, my soul. I adore you and I lay my life before you. How I love you, Spirit, I adore you and lay my life. I adore you and I lay my life before you. How I love you, Spirit, I adore you. Lay my life before you. How As we gather in his name, he is here, he is here, and he wants to work a wonder yesterday and today and forevermore the same. He is here, he is 
is here and he's moving among us he is here he is here as we gather in his name he is here he is here and he wants to work a wonder yesterday and today and forevermore the same yesterday fitting song amen he is here do you feel his presence in this house that's the touch of the holy spirit lord we thank you father for the tangible gift of the holy spirit lord god we thank you that the holy spirit is just that it's a spirit you're a spirit but you're holy lord god and you said that you call us out of darkness into your marvelous light lord for such a time as this father we thank you that you led us to this house tonight, Lord. We, we thank you that you gave us the opportunity to worship you in spirit and in truth and in unity, Father God, as the body of Christ, your children, Lord. And even now, by faith, Lord, we surrender the rest of the service to you, Lord God. We ask you to speak to our hearts, that you would declare vision from your throne room to our hearts, individual members of the body of Christ, Lord. We're not all a ear, we're not all a toe, we're not all a finger, but we're all a part of the body of Christ. We have a purpose, Lord God, and you are the head. And Lord, without your vision, without you imparting into us, Lord, we're just wandering aimlessly, Lord. But when you speak vision from your purpose, from yourself to each of us, Lord God, that gives us a reason, Lord God, to go forward according to your plan. So we ask you even now, as we open up the scriptures, that you would speak, Father, and that you would give us ears to hear and hearts to obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ah, what a mighty God we serve. Hey, we're going to take a tithe and an offering. How many people like that? Do you guys feel that cool breeze? I'm not talking about the Holy Spirit. That's a cool breeze, too. But do you guys feel that cool breeze flowing through here? Woo, that's called uh, AC. How many people were out today in the heat suffering a little bit? Anybody? How many people? Okay, here's a good question. How many people at your house didn't turn on the AC because you wanted to save money and you suffered in the heat? Anybody? You don't have to raise your hand. Well, praise God. But see, now we're in the house of the Lord. But are we not a part of the body of Christ? How many people know that tithes and offering goes to paying the AC bill? Amen. It goes to paying the water bill, too. Good thing we got water to flush, eh? Oh, that backing up. In the name of Jesus, I would ask you to give according to the word of God in obedience in your tithes and your offering. And know whenever you give to God, you're not giving to man. You're not giving to anybody. We're giving in obedience to the word of God. Amen? And who are we giving it to? Jesus, the God of heaven and earth. So even now. I pray, Lord, for a blessing on the giver that gives in faith, Lord God, in obedience. And you also said in another place, he said to be a joyful giver, Lord God. In the mighty name of Jesus, I pray that you would use the finances that we put together in your pot for your kingdom, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. You going to sing another song? Yeah. Hallelujah. going to dial this in a minute. Yeah. I went away completely, I think. There we go.
church, Lord, be glorified. In my church, Lord, be glorified, be glorified. In my church, Lord, be glorified today in my life. Praise God. You know, sometimes it's uh, not comfortable talking about certain things, but, you know, do you think it's important to talk about things that are uncomfortable sometimes? Who can think of something that's uncomfortable that you think we need to talk about? Since I already got money off the table and ties off the table. What else? Anybody? Sin? I like it. Amen. Anything else? Oh, that's good. How about death? Amen? False guilt? Well, praise God. False guilt comes from the devil. Amen? Uh, we're going to talk tonight about evangelism. Or not evangelists. What are we talking about? We're on uh, the five-fold ministry. We already hit two. Uh, remember what they were, anybody? Apostles. Apostles and prophets. Amen. And what's the next one? Evangelists. Now, this is crazy. Now, who can give me a definition of evangelist? Anybody? Go ahead, brother. Praise God. I like it. Anybody else? Huh? Uh, spreading, the word of God. spreading the word of God. Amen. Anybody else? Doug. Huh? Doug. Doug. Well, he's an evangelist. I like it. I think he's a prophet, too. <laughs> Praise God. Hey, you know why Doug's an evangelist? Anybody? He does that, too. He got the fire of God burning in his soul. Amen. And it just wanted to come out. He's, what does it say? I got shut up in my bones if I don't declare it. Amen. But this is crazy. I looked up this word evangelist in the uh, concordance. Anybody have an idea or a guess of how many times it was in the, in the, in the uh, concordance? You would think it would be a lot, wouldn't you? Three. One is Ephesians 4, 12. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, and pastors. One was in 2 Timothy. He told Timothy to preach the, the word of God in season and out season. Right? For rebrew, I think it's that. I don't even know what that. But he says, but do the work of an evangelist. Amen? And then we're going to look at the third place. And this is what I found out about the word of God. I'm glad what you said, Mike, because, or the word evangelist. Every time I found the word evangelist, which was three times, it also said the word preach. So what is evangelism? Preaching. Preaching. And it, have you ever felt obligated by God to preach to somebody? And you know, I say preach, you know, people say, well, don't preach at me, right? That's not necessarily preaching. It can be preaching. But what is preaching in a nutshell? Anybody? Declaring the word, the good news. Exactly right. That's exactly what it is, declaring the good news. It's not declaring the bad news, right? You want to declare the bad news, go to tell somebody to go to CNN. Tell somebody to go to Fox News. You find all sorts of bad news. It might be fake news, but it's still bad news. But if you want the good news, there's only one place you can get the good news. Anybody? The Word of God. Amen? So when it talks about being the, do the work of an evangelist, it says preach the Word of God. Amen? So let's go. We're going to hop around a couple places. We're going to end up at chapter 8. But let's go real quick to Acts chapter 21, verse 8. That's where we're going. And just so you know, from there we're going to Acts 6 and then Acts 8. But we're going to go to 621, or no, Acts 21, verse 8. I found this very interesting. Now this is 21, is when uh, Saul, uh, Paul was on his way back and he was going through all these, uh, tr uh, moving around on, the, um, on his journey. Verse 8 says this, On the next day, 
we who were Paul's companions departed and came to Caesarea, and they entered the house of Philip. What was it, Philip? He was an evangelist, the, the, the evangelist. And check out who Philip was with, the evangelist, who was one of the seven. Keep that in mind. He was one of the seven. And he stayed in, in, in sta who was one of the seven and stayed with him, Paul. Verse 9. Now this man, the evangelist, had four virgin daughters. And what did they do? Prophesy. So the gifts were moving. Remember, what did he tell us? He didn't want us to be ignorant of. The gifts of the Spirit. Amen? We read that. He, the, there's three things he specifically said he don't want you to be ignorant of. But the one thing we're talking about, he doesn't want us to be ignorant of the gifts of the Spirit. If he doesn't want us to be ignorant of the gifts of the Spirit, what does that tell us about the gifts of the Spirit? They're important. Exactly right, brother. So here he's the evangelist, and he had four virgin daughters, and they prophesied. So what that might tell you about uh, Philip? Woo! He's a man of God. Amen. It was coming down. Hey, you know, men of God, women of God, don't hang out, you know, sidestepping with the, the men of the devil, right? No, we're in the body of Christ. Does that mean you don't talk to somebody that's in sin? Of course you talk to somebody in sin. How else are they going to hear, amen, unless somebody is sent? And if he's sent, what does that mean? He was an evangelist. Now, do you think do you have, there is an office of evangelist, but there's also just evangelizing. Would you agree with that? Can everybody in here evangelize? Can everyone in here actually be in the gift of the office of evangelism? Is it ever, well, should we always try to evangelize? Amen. And then it says this, verse 10, And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet, so here's another guy, a prophet who had the office of prophet named Agabus, and he came down from Judea. And how do we know he's a prophet? Well, here's one reason. Look at verse 11. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and he said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of Gentiles. And he goes on, even Paul says, Man, you're breaking my heart. Don't tell me that this is going to happen because I'm going to go. Why was Paul so set on going? Anybody? Because he was called by God to go to Jerusalem. And the people were afraid of it, kind of, because they knew that, you know, something was going on. Well, let's read on, because I wasn't planning on it, but let's read it. Verse 12. Now, when he had heard these things, Paul, both we and those from that place, pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. Verse 13, then Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. See, he was set in his mind, I don't care what is going to happen. I know God is sending me to Jerusalem. You're not going to stop me. You're not going to persuade me. The devil's not going to persuade me. Man ain't going to persuade me. God has already spoken in my heart, and I have to say the chorus. As a matter of fact, remember when Jesus said to Peter, I think it was Peter, Get behind me, Satan. That's right. It's kind of this guy was breaking his heart because he was trying to persuade him, but he was letting him know. How about that? Maybe God was testing Paul, saying, hey, I'm going to give you the news what goes ahead. What are you going to do? And Paul said, hey, don't break my heart. I'm going. Amen. But what are we talking about? Peter the, or Philip the evangelist. So look what it said. It said the evangelist Philip, who was one of the seven. So let's go to chapter uh, 6, Acts chapter 6, and see what it says about that. Acts chapter 6, verse 1. Now, in those days when the number of the disciples was, what were they doing? They were multiplying. Now, the church was multiplying. The church was growing. So they, what do you expect the next word here is going to say? There arose a complaint. Amen? Can, can, can you believe that? The church has grown and there's complaints arising. Amen? That's odd, isn't it? Or can you take that as, yeah, that makes sense, right? What's the message? Let's not be complaining in church. Amen? You know, if you got something to complain about, that means you have something to forgive somebody about. Isn't that wonderful? It's a perfect opportunity for you to forgive that person or that thing if you want to complain or murmur about it. God will bring something to you and go, it kind of smacks you around, jabs you in the heart, jabs you in the side of the head. Boy, that rubs me raw. Ah, how about forgive? Amen? Because, you know, 
pastor said it a couple weeks ago. If you're perfect and you're looking for a perfect church, this probably ain't the house. <laughs> Amen? I, I never found a perfect church yet. I sometimes sit at home on my uh, couch kneeling before God, and I find out that church is way imperfect. You know what I'm saying? Because we are un imperfect people. Amen? But God's perfect, isn't he? Ah, uh, he's a wonderful God. Let me just say this. Many of you, and I believe this by faith, I believe God is trying to bring us to a new place in our own walks, in our own hearts. Don't be afraid. I just read this thing the other day about, um, um, well, it was a transgender girl, and she was talking about, she was 15, and she had her breast removed because she wanted to be transgender. And the counselors around her were all pushing her for it. The teachers were pushing her, just do it, just do it. This is the greatest thing. Don't regret it, just go forward. And by the time she was 17, she was brokenhearted. She said, I don't believe what I did. And now she's before the people in California, before our government, pleading with them. Please, don't make this a transgender state. Because they're trying to make it a sanctuary state for transgenders. If you want to be transgender in a state, where they don't allow it, then you can come to California. We'll help fund it. And all these people, well, they're cheerleading her on, encouraging her. Come on, you can do it. You can do it. She's 15 years old. And that's what she said. At 15 years old, she can't make that decision in her life. And two years later, she's 17. Now, now she's deformed a little bit. Now she's really got problems. And all those people that were cheering her on. Thank you, sister. All those people, they're not there. And they even threatened her mom and dad from trying to stop her from doing it. Because, uh, you know, they want their agenda, right? I don't remember what the point was. But the point was, well, that's, the, I forget what the point was, but that's, huh? Hey. Let's not push an agenda. But, oh, that's what the point was. This is what she said. She said, all the, lo and behold, you know what I found out? All, and not only her and all the people that she knew that went through it, she said it was just them afraid of growing up and being women, and it was an uncomfortable situation. So all this that they're pushing might just, how many, I don't know about anybody else. I'm 57 years old, and I'm still trying to figure out how to be a man. Amen. Anybody still trying to? Yeah, exactly right. I, I, when I was 15, I thought I was the smartest guy I knew. Anything. I wanted to be a man, tap myself on the chest. Then I got to 18, I could be a man. I all of a sudden started drinking because I couldn't handle reality. And then for 20, you know, uh, in and off, battling with drugs and alcohol, because there's a thing called reality that we struggle with. And lo and behold, all this confusion, and it, she came to the realization that she just could not really cope with growing up to be a woman. And it's not a bad thing. How many women have had that battle in your own life? How many people in this house, a man or a woman, still sometimes have to look yourself in the mirror and say, you better grow up and be a man or better be, grow up and be a woman, right? Because life is difficult, amen? And this is what I can tell you about God. He doesn't always bring us on precious, beautiful, only uh, bl blessing journeys. Every road, yeah. If we're going to fight for something eternal, get ready for a fight, right? And if God's trying to grow us up in the spirit realm, it's not going to be easy. Think about when he brought them out of uh, Egypt and he brought them to the Red Sea. That was mind-blowing to them. So I don't know where you're at on your journey, man, but do not be afraid to go forward in faith to what God has in store for you. Amen? Because I promise you this, you can be an apostle, you can be a pastor, you can be an evangelist, you can be a prophet, you can be a teacher, you can be a servant, you can be an obedient young man, a, be a person of it. It doesn't matter what God wants to choose to use you as. But as he's bringing you to the next place, it's not going to be a smooth ride all the time. It's going to be bumpy rides. And in the bumpy rides, that's when we really find out who God is. Amen? And Philip... It says in verse chapter 21, he was an evangelist. Well, let's look real quick at chapter 6. Let's read on. The complaint started in verse 1, and they complained about the Hebrew. 
the, and the complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists or, or the Greek-speaking Jews because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. We could go to church and just complain about, hey, you know, they're not taking care of that guy. You're not doing that. Making a, a list of complaints. And that's what they did. Verse 2, but the 12, who's the 12? The apostles, the disciples, summoned the multitude of the disciples, the rest of the people, and said, it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Now, isn't that a wonderful thing? That's part of the reason why we want to unload some of the load off Pastor Dave. Because it's not desirable. We want the man of God to study the word of God. Amen? Now, that don't mean he can't do other things, but that's got to be the number one priority. Would you agree? It says it even right here. Therefore, brethren, seek out. What did they say? Seek out from among you. That would be us. Seven. And what did it say about Philip? He was one of the seven. So here he's getting to be right now the position of a deacon. But if you look in chapter 21, guess what he was called? An evangelist. So he started off as a deacon. Sometimes we look down at a deacon. What does the deacon do? Well, here, what was the deacon doing? Serving tables. That dirty word, serve, you know what I'm saying? Ah. But what was the requirement to serve? Verse 3, therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation. What was the first thing? If you're going to serve tables, be a man or a woman of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer in the ministry of the word. Amen? And then it goes on, verse 5, And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith. Now, Stephen was the first deacon. Didn't work out too good for Stephen. Would you agree? He, what happened to Stephen? Now, that took some courage, wouldn't you agree? He got the call of God to be a deacon, and they stepped him up. He gave him the role, and he went out. What was the first thing he did? He was an evangelist. He preached the gospel. And when he went out to preach the gospel, they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to hear it. And you know who these were? You know who these people were that really stoned him? They weren't the heathen.